Welcome, everybody, to the fourth episode of The Nate Shomer Show. Today, I'm sitting down with Tony Gallardo, a good friend of mine. He is a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States Marine Corps. He is an attack helicopter pilot with over 300 combat operations in the Marine Corps. He is also a board member of Cammies and Canines, vice president, which is a nonprofit organization here in the San Diego area. They help homeless veterans and rescue dogs. I'm also part of that team. And he is a co-founder of On Season Canine Nutrition, which is quality raw dog food for your canine companion. He's done a lot of things, and he's going to share some of his stories, some of his combat operations, and maybe give some of us young and some advice on what we could do to better our lives and to get into a position of success as he's been doing. So thank you so much for being on my show. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. Thank you. All right. So, um... Now, we didn't serve directly with each other in the Marine Corps, but there was a short period of time when we were at the same base at the same time, and we just didn't know it. I believe so, yeah, at the Recruit Depot. I think you you were just leaving as I was just showing up, so. When did you show up there again? I showed up in June of 2010. 2010. Oh, okay, so you actually came right after I left. Okay. Was that your last unit before you retired? No, I retired. I went to uh, Air Station Camp Pendleton and finished up at uh, at the Air Station there. So we both know First Sergeant Alvarez, good buddy of mine, and I found out he's also a good buddy of yours. And before the podcast started, we were talking about um, he ended up getting the Navy and Marine Corps medal, correct? Yes. And that is something that I didn't fully understand how it happened or what took place. Can you talk about it a little bit? Yeah, from what I've read and what he told me was uh, they had, I think they were in Jordan and or somewhere in the Middle East. It was not, it was a, it was a training exercise. They had just landed. Uh, Joe and his team, First Sergeant Alvarez and his team, had gotten off of the Osprey, and as it lifted to uh, take off, it actually ended up, I'm not sure exactly what happened, but it ended up arguing into the ground. It crashed in the ground right there in front of him, and he and his team all ran into the Osprey to try to pull out any survivors that they could get. I believe two survived, two did not, but they were instrumental in, in getting these guys out of the aircraft so at least they didn't they didn't burn to death well i was asking you about it because i thought it was a helicopter and then you corrected me because you were an attack helicopter pilot what (laughs) helicopter exactly did you fly in combat i flew the ah1w super cobra super that sounds Mm -hmm. so awesome which has been phased out now by the ah1z okay and Mm -hmm. uh if you're listening to this on itunes you won't be able to see the image but on youtube we'll definitely put an image of these helicopters uh and what was it that these guys were in when that incident happened a v-22 osprey and that's like a normal troop carrier or what exactly it is, is. it replaced the ch-46 as a medium lift troop carrier so it um it's a tilt rotor aircraft which is is different it, it can it can hover like a helicopter and it can fly like an airplane it just depends on the uh the configuration it's in at the time and he was telling me about it so what they were doing is they were practicing dropping troops off taking off getting more troops and they were kind of going back and forth and he said as it was taking off. So you're telling me that it didn't, how would it nosedive like that? So it came up, what is it, was it, did it catch the wind or something? Or was it just like a completely fluke accident or how would something, do you know how to pilot one of those? I do not know. It's, uh, and and the thing about that, when I do talk to guys, it is, it it is a very foreign type of aircraft. When I understand the requirements to make it fly as a tilt rotor airplane, because when a helicopter, everything is always at 90 degrees. The, uh, the, the rotor and the aircraft or the mass of the aircraft are supposed to be at 90 degrees. It depends on, uh, you know, what you're doing. Whereas as a tilt rotor aircraft, they'll be at 90 degrees. And then as they transition to forward flight, the nacelles, I think they call them, they'll, once they get fast enough, the nacelles will be pointed straight ahead and it'll fly like a, like a twin propeller airplane. And then as it comes into land, it'll adjust its speed and the nacelles will then pivot back up until it's in a landing configuration and then it'll drop down onto the ground. So it has some, some different aerodynamic properties and requirements that either both an airplane and a helicopter have from my understanding. So him jumping in and pulling out the guys that were in there, he ended up being awarded the Navy and Marine Corps medal. Now, Mm -hmm. how big of a medal or how important of a medal is that? That, That's pretty much the highest medal you can get for a non-combat action. So, um, in the military, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's different ones at, at higher levels of government, but, you know, for the Marine Corps or the Navy, it's the highest one you can get in a peacetime operation, and it's for putting yourself in danger 
in a peacetime operation to save fellow service members. Basically risking your life. Right. Yeah, when he was telling me about that, I completely, because I'd already been out of the Marine Corps since 2010, and he was telling me about that maybe six months ago. Mm-hmm. And I'd completely forgotten about that medal. I mean, I had to look it up and read about it again. And, and I thought about it for a second. I'm like, what, what type of situation would you be in in a non-combat operation where you could risk your life? But, mm-hmm. I mean, even training operations, things can happen to where somebody's life could be put in danger. I mean, when I was, um, after I came back from my second deployment from Iraq, we were, I was with track company and we were doing some training operations and often the troops in the back of those Amtraks and, and Amtrak is, uh, basically it's a troop carrier. You know, I'm telling this to the audience. Yeah. I know, you know, so it's a troop carrier. It's almost like a tank in a way that carries troops. Often it'll have a Mark 19, which is like a fully automatic grenade launcher, or it'll have a 50 caliber machine gun up on top. And often the top doors will open. The troops will be sitting up on top to provide security. But a lot of times when we're doing training operations, a lot of the training kind of crews around Camp Pendleton is for the, the trackers. You know, so we're sitting in the back and we'll get to the location we need to get at and we'll do some drills, we'll run out, so on and so forth. So we were training and we were, you know, I'm sitting in the back, not even really paying attention to where we're going. And all of a sudden the Amtrak started to tilt on its side and it tilted so far on the side that some of the guys who had fallen asleep fell forward and face planted into each other. So we're completely on our side at this point. And I looked out the door and we were on the side of a hill. So we went up the side of this hill and it tilted over and we had our packs attached to the side and had the packs not been attached to the side, it would have continued to roll. And we were probably a hundred plus feet up this hill. So if it continued to roll, it probably would have rolled maybe 20 times or so, Mm -hmm. give or take. And the guys inside the Amtrak would either be dead or severely injured. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always risks when you're training for any sort of combat operations where something can happen and Mm -hmm. speaking of have you ever had any because i mean just thinking about being a attack helicopter pilot it's pretty intimidating sounding were you intimidated when you were first getting ready to to go to school or to learn about it or kind of walk us through how that works well the what they call the hmla community the helicopter marine light attack so hmla community is very well known they always say that they're, they're very well known for eating their young so it's a it's a tough community when you show up you are expected to study hard, work hard, learn your aircraft, learn your weapon systems, learn your threat weapon systems, so that you, when you become an aircraft commander, you are a functional and useful part of the team. So not only can you fly the aircraft, but flying, talking, employing weapon systems, uh, you know, proper uh, weapon to target match, and also employing that against threat weapon systems so that you, you ensure that you, your, your survivability is higher and their survivability is lower. How long was the school for it? Um, the... So for to get basically qualified in the in the Cobra was, I think it was six months, and then from there I went to my tactical squad on HMLA 369, the gunfighters, gunfighters rule, and um, that's our, that's the thing we always we always do that. Nate flexes for no reason, but when he does it, we'll have to say gunfighters <laughs> rule, right? I'll do that from now on. There you go, yeah, gunfighters rule, but. Um, so when I went to the gunfighters, I think it was October 1996 when I joined the gunfighters. And, you know, that's where it begins. You know, you're, you're really nothing in the squadron. And, you know, in typical military fashion, you know. They, so it's, you know, it, it's a tough community. So when you show up, you are expected to make all your maps for all the local training areas. Start learning. And you have a specific syllabus that you fly. They call it training and readiness manual, the TNR. So you have specific flights and there's specific requirements for each flight that you have to study for and be prepared for. And as you go through the syllabus, you know, they start breaking out the folks that, that are good pilots, that work hard, that study hard, and um, have the ability to you know, advance more quickly or get more uh, designations and qualifications in the COBRA. Police officers, when they're going through police academy, I mean, I'm not a police officer, but they do some sort of or an extended course on defensive driving techniques and tactics that they're able to implement when they're, you know, chasing the bad guy or mm-hmm. whatever the case may be. Are there extended amount of different sort of maybe piloting exercises that you guys have to rehearse over and over again? Or how does that work? I mean, how often are you able to actually get inside of your, you know, uh, respected craft and go up mm-hmm. there and practice some of these techniques that you are quite possibly going to implement when you're in a combat situation? Yeah, so when I was a, a junior Marine, I remember the, the commanding officer of the, 
of the squadron, he wanted everybody to have at least 20 hours of flight time a month. So that equated to about 10 flights because each flight would be about two hours. So if you think about 10 flights a month, 10, you know, if you were lucky, you got 10 to 12, maybe even 15 flights a month. And each one had a different uh, requirement. So some days you would, you would go out and your job was to just shoot rockets in 20 millimeter and, and just concentrate on that only. It's just aerial gunnery. So you go in and you, you're, you're shooting at targets just to practice. And then other days you would create a tactical scenario where you would put a threat out, a, a notional threat, and, and, and a uh, pretend threat out in an area. And then what you would do is you would figure out and overlay all the threat systems uh, capabilities and then you would create a tactical scenario to be able to fly in and attack that, uh, that pretend target with the weapon systems you have on board. So it just it can made you think a little bit more. You know, it started at the basics, just basic shooting, and then, okay, now there's a threat out there. Figure out how to, to, to fly into the area and attack that threat without getting shot down yourself. Talking about getting shot down, you've been shot at in combat, right? While being um, up in the... Yeah, I mean, a lot of times you, you don't know until you get hit, but talking to some guys on the ground, um, on some folks that we supported in different cities in Iraq, they they told us that they, they shot at us a lot. Were you in Iraq and Afghanistan or just Iraq? Just Iraq. Okay. I never made it to Afghanistan. I was in just Iraq, too. It's mm -hmm. okay. How many deployments to Iraq did you do? I did three. Three deployments. So, mm -hmm. so you got me beat there. I only did two. <laughs> and you flew. Well, it was over 300, correct? It is. You know, I don't remember the number. It might even be closer to 400 total. Oh, wow. Yeah. Do you have any um, stories that stand out that <laughs> might be worth sharing? Yeah, no, I do. Um, it's funny because I, I usually don't talk about these a lot. I think about them every now and then. I remember when I came back from Iraq, I mean, you just didn't think about it constantly because it's, uh, it's something that's raw and in your mind at all. I remember, yeah, the first time we we shot back at somebody, it was just, kind of a we were just out doing a, a patrol flying and there was an army unit on the ground and they were on one side of the euphrates and uh, there was this house on the other side of the euphrates and they kept telling us hey we're you know there's guys in the house that are taking pot shots at us and can you take a look so we we flew in and we're we're uh, you know we're, we're perched up high probably a thousand fifteen hundred feet just kind of looking down i got the my front seater was in the uh, in the optics taking a look and all of a sudden these guys in black pajamas start pouring out of this house and in with AK 47s and everything else. So my gunner's like, Hey, we got MAMs. We call them MAMs, military age males. It was the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the term we used over the radio. So we said, we got man some, we got MAMs in black pajamas with weapons coming out of the house. And the, uh, the JTAC, the joint terminal uh, attack controller said his only words were cleared hot. And we're like, Wow. Okay. So it cleared hot and we just, I just basically tipped over and the Huey I had behind me with uh, Wedge Rampy, an awesome guy. Um, if he gets to hear this, Wedge, well, we were, a, we were an awesome combat crew. The Huey just opened up with a minigun and just started obliterating this area. It was uh, They all ran into this palm grove. We dove in and we just, I just popped rockets all in the different spots of the palm grove. We pulled off, came back around because they wanted to put a Hellfire missile in the house. And so we did that. We came back around, put a Hellfire missile in the house, and then, and then pulled off. And it was just, just like that. We went from just flying around to pretty much in emptying. In a combat situation. Yeah, emptying our, you know, coming back, uh, what we call Winchester, with, uh, you know, shooting off all our ordnance. And, uh, and people hear Hellfire all the time, but can you explain exactly what a Hellfire is? Yeah, people do hear what a Hellfire is. So a Hellfire is a 100-pound a missile. So it's not that big. I mean, it's, I forget what the exact length was. I, I had to know it at some point in my life or I would have gotten yelled at. So, <laughs> but I remember it was 100 pounds. So um, it's a 100-pound missile. And basically what it does is it seeks uh, coded laser energy. So when you... When you put a laser, whether it's from the aircraft or from the ground, they will tell you a code. So, you know, the code might be, a lot of times we used 1111, 1234, I mean, something simple. And they would just say code, you know, quad ones, which was a common one because it was uh, the strongest, what they call PRF, pulse repetition frequency. So they shine a laser on the target. You code the missile or you program the missile to read that code. And once the missile sees the code, it'll give you a... Uh, uh, indication in the cockpit that it sees it and that it's within the limits. As long as the diamond showed up inside the circle, you're within limits. Boom, 
fire the missile off and it would it would uh, ride that laser or, or ride the the reflection of the laser all the way down to the target and hit it would you have to maintain on the target in order yes. for it to hit so if you start yeah. to move it would veer off as well right yeah so the, the laser had to stay on the target correct okay, that's almost like a uh what is the rocket that has a wire attached to it where the they're toe. able to control the tow mm -hmm. gun, right? Mm -hmm. And tow that's, missile. that's, uh, they've had some, uh, training incidents with those as well. Those are kind of dangerous because of that. They can be. I mean, we shot toes off the, the Cobra as well. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I don't I, I, they don't now. I'm pretty sure the Zulu doesn't shoot it anymore. I think it's Hellfires only cause they have so many different models of Hellfire now, but we used to shoot the tow missile and yeah, I mean, every now and then they would fail. Um, you know, one of the things people don't understand about ordnance, so if you see a, somebody shoots a rocket and it just goes, or a mortar, so you see this all the time, the mortar fails, where a mortar will, somebody will drop a mortar and it'll go thunk, and it'll just come out of the thing and land on the ground. Right. Well, a mortar requires a certain amount of, or, or, or all these weapons, whether it be rockets, tows, hellfires, everything else. And they a require. mortar is indirect fire, so often right. a lot of people listening are not going to be <clears throat> military people. Yeah, so but, but the point I'm trying to make with these explosives is, they have to hit a certain amount of G-force to actually arm it. Mm. So with a tow, even if you have an accident, if it just thunk, it shoots out of the tube and it falls on the ground, it's not armed. Similar to the 203 as well, how it has to have a certain amount of uh, spirals before it right. activates. To fuse it, yeah. To fuse it, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, were at, we actually had a really close call when we were in one of our Amtraks. So for whatever reason, when we were going into the invasion in Iraq in uh, 03, uh, crossing the line of departure, they had everybody place their weapons into condition one. And so mm -hmm. uh, condition one is magazine inserted, rounding chamber, bolt forward, safety on ejection port cover closed, right? And <laughs> so some of the guys had their 203s loaded, which I thought was absolute insanity. Uh, and one of the guys, he jumped back down into the Amtrak from being on overhead watch or air watch. And when he jumped down, it somehow shot his 203 off. And his hand was in front of the 203. So it hit his hand, shattered his entire hand, oh, yeah. and landed in the center of the Amtrak with 22 Marines inside. And everybody, I wasn't in this Amtrak, <laughs> but from what I heard, they're all looking at it. Everybody's, you know, hearts <laughs> pounding, wondering if it's going to go off, but it didn't go off because, of course, it wasn't able to arm because it didn't spiral enough. So when it shoots out of the 203, it starts to turn. And it needs a certain amount of rotations. And mm -hmm. luckily for them, it didn't rotate enough. So. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of them, yeah, have fail safes built into them. Like the tow, it has the tow has two motors, a launch motor and a flight motor. So the launch motor, it was designed for people to shoot it on the ground. So they hit the launch motor and it just goes, you know, basically so you go puff. It shoots the, the, the explosion out the back. Everybody knows not to be there. It launches the missile about 60 feet, I think it is. And then the flight motor kicks in. And the flight motor goes off so that it doesn't burn the guy that's shooting it. Mm. So that was the that was the, the thought process behind the tow. Well, it, it fired the same way off the, the the Cobra because the missile was essentially the same kind of missile. Did you do any um, uh, night missions? Oh, tons! Yeah, we trained a lot at night. Yeah, like vision goggles. Yeah. What is it? You know, we had one one um, <clears throat> raid that we did at night. Long story short, we we came in. It was. Um, it was basically a college that they were using as a stronghold. Mm -hmm. And so our mission was to go there and take them out. And they didn't even tell us that, or maybe they did, maybe the higher ups. I mean, I was just a corporal at the time, so I didn't get all the details. Yeah. And when we got there, a Humvee pulled up and this Humvee started playing on the speakers, let the bodies hit the floor, mm -hmm. super loud. And we had a building that we were going up on top of, and we were actually in Newsweek because of this exact attack that we did. And we placed all our machine guns up on top of this uh, rooftop. And once we got up there, we could still hear the music playing, but then a couple helicopters just started laying down fire from the sky. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea they were there. Yeah. And my only assumption is that the music came in to mask the sound of the helicopters coming in to Maybe. confuse the enemy. Yeah, because a lot of times if they heard the rotors of the Cobra or the Hueys coming in, they would just disengage and run. Mm -hmm. They used that a lot, actually, when we were there in, uh, in Ramadi and in uh, Fallujah. The time that I was there, 2005, 2006, when they would get surrounded because the Marines were in this, this spot in Ramadi that was easily surrounded. So whenever it would, things would heat up, they would send us on what they called a tick, a uh, troops in contact. And we would just come in. And as soon as they heard the noise, enemy would disengage and, and disperse and away because they knew what was coming. Were you part <clears throat> of Operation Phantom Fury? 
No, that was before we got there. I believe that was 2004, five. five? Okay, so it was early 2005. So Phantom when we got Fury there, was Fallujah. Yeah, so when we yeah. got there, Fallujah was relatively calm. Oh, really? But, you know, there were still things going on there, but it was relatively calm. Pretty much the main mm -hmm. fighting had already ended at that point. The main fighting in Fallujah, now yeah. up uh, in Al Qaim, right next to the, uh, right where the Euphrates and the Syrian border. And Ramadi was pretty bad too, right? Yeah, Ramadi was, like was pretty Ramadi bad. Triangle. Yeah, we were did a lot there? of. Yes, we, we 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 support a lot of Ramadi operations. Yeah, my brother was in Ramadi. He was also Marine Corps Infantry, and he mm -hmm. was basically shot at every day up there. Yeah, it he was... only spent three months overseas mm -hmm. in Iraq. I spent. 18 months and he probably got into just as many firefights as I did in his three months just being at part of that it was called the Ramadi Triangle right I believe so it might yeah for, for the ground guys because remember on the on the aviation side we weren't always privy to you know the the way you guys would would call it on the ground mm. we just had our intel reports we would go we would get to you know we would get a call we would have a frequency somebody to talk to and then uh, we go from there. So they may have called it the Ramadi Triangle. I don't remember. Have you seen? Uh, I'm going to throw in a movie reference here. <clears throat> have you seen um, the most recent Mission Impossible? I don't know. I saw one uh, flying back from Georgia a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so it was a really new one and really recent. It was the most recent one. And Tom Cruise is an actual helicopter pilot. And one of the things that he does is he does this like spiral where he goes down this canyon and he actually oh, I did, did see it that. Yeah, I did see that in one. the movie. Uh -huh. Is that a technique you guys would do as well? Um, no. What is, that? what is that called? Do you know? Just a, a spiral down. Yeah, I mean, you know, basically you would just, you'd push the nose down, kick the, uh, kick the pedal in that direction and just, and just you, know, you, you would push the, the stick down to the right, right pedal and then it would just, you'd just get into a, I imagine that would be pretty dangerous. No, as long as you stay controlled, it's not dangerous. No? No. I've only been in a helicopter once, and it freaks me out. <laughs> I was in one of the, the what is it, the troop transporter, where it has the two helicopters with the two rotors on top. CH-46, yeah. Yeah, that freaked me out, and it made me super sick. Yeah, well, those, yeah, I mean, those <laughs> things move like this, constantly moving like this. So if, you, if you're prone to motion sickness, a frog will get you sick. Is it like a car, though? If you're the pilot, it's not as bad. But if yes. you're a passenger, it's, it's yeah. way worse. Yeah, if you're the, if you're, yeah, if you're the one doing the, the flying, you, it's not nearly as bad. Was it intimidating, though, the first time you got in the pilot's seat and you took off? Oh, yeah. I mean, what did I that, remember that flight. Yeah. What did that feel like? It's it got to be intimidating. It, it was. I mean, having because we train in flight school, we train in the TH-57, which is your basic news helicopter that you see flying around. And then, you know, you get into a Cobra, and it's, you know, the Cobra weighs five times more than that one does. Weighs five times more. I mean, the blades are literally that wide. You know, the, the one of the 57 is like five, six inches wide. And... It's just, I mean, you, you know, you're in an attack helicopter now. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just kind of badass when you get in there and you just see all the, you know, you, you're sitting in the cockpit and you got the armor all around you and all the weapon system. It's, uh, it, it, was, it was really cool. And talking about the armor all around you, did you ever feel any of the bullets impacting the helicopter when you're in there? I mean, I know that you, in fact, on your plaque. Yeah, I've got the, the, one, the one bullet that hit me is up on my, uh, in my shadow box. There on my uh, the Iraq patch that I wore while we were. Uh, so you only your actual you were only hit once. Only hit once. That's pretty lucky. Yeah, which is it is, and, it, and it's silly because it was on. I don't want to call it a, a kind of a dumb run, but uh, you know there were other runs we did where, you know. Um, so we were supporting Second uh, Battalion First Marines after we went through Al Qaim. 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines in, an, uh, in a city called New Beatty. And we did multiple danger close attack runs in there, and I never got hit. And what was interesting was after that operation, and, and, and I, was, I remember being, and still to this day when I think about it, it's like, holy mackerel. Um, some of the, uh, the Marines came back through the, the forward operating base at Al Qaim where, we were, where the helicopters were kept after the battle was over and one of them we were talking to one of them and he said he said yeah sir he says every time you guys dove in when you pulled off the target we had to jump underneath the vehicles and i said well, why and he said because all the bullets they were shooting at you would start coming down like pouring rain all over the place and i said really he said yeah and i was like i had no idea i mean i assumed they were shooting at us 
But I had yeah, was, no idea they, they were shooting that much at us. So I was pretty lucky. That's, that's surprising, yeah, because I was actually about to ask if maybe they do not shoot at attack helicopters as much because it is such a hard target. You know, I mean, they always say be a oh, hard no, target, they, and if you're a really hard target, I was almost thinking I'm trying to put myself in the perspective of the enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, and I thought about that when I was over in Iraq during my second deployment, and we were in Najaf Cemetery, which before Fallujah happened was considered some of the worst fighting seen since Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking of how intimidating it was. I mean, we would drive by the cemetery and there would be insurgents sitting on these different tombs and whatnot, looking at us holding RPGs and AK 47s and RPKs and just mm -hmm. staring at us as we drive by. And we weren't able to engage because it was a religious location, second largest cemetery in mm -hmm. the world until they started to engage us. And then when we pushed into the cemetery, I just remember <coughs> how intimidating it was going into that environment. And then I thought to myself, imagine how intimidating it's got to be from their perspective, because this is what is, I mean, we're known throughout the entire world as being one of the greatest fighting forces mm. that has ever stepped foot on this planet. And we're coming in facing them. And not only is it just the troops, but you also have the tanks and you have the Amtraks and you have the helicopters and you have artillery and all these other things going on. I mean, that's got to be incredibly intimidating from the enemy's perspective. And then to think, okay, am I going to sit here and engage this attack helicopter, most likely not doing any damage, and then give away my position to where they're easily going to turn around and take us out. Is mm -hmm. it worth taking that shot? You see well, what I mean? Well, it, 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 and that's an interesting perspective because there were, there were times where if we were not in a specific, um, you know, named operation or, you know, an engagement with a battalion like we were there, a lot of times they were hesitant to shoot at us because if they gave away their position, we were cleared to engage immediately. So I think a lot of times they wouldn't shoot at us because they knew like we, cause a lot of the, the patrols we would do, we would just do standard routes in areas where there were hot spots, and there were, I'm sure there were people down there that wanted to shoot at mm -hmm. us, but they wouldn't do it because they knew that uh, we would turn on them quickly. Right. Uh, there were several times where they fired SA seven shoulder launched missiles. And that was a calculated risk as well, because the SA seven leaves it's a trail. It leaves a trail from where it goes. So if you meant, well, if there's two helicopters, because there was always two, if you shoot and you hit one, the other one is still going to attack you. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it was a, uh, big risk, a big risk. And they, they took it. They took down, uh, they shot several missiles at, us only one hit um didn't hit your craft though. no it, it no your, uh, wingman still no it didn't no it didn't hit my wingman yeah you still call wingman no this was uh interestingly yeah and, and i figured we would talk about this as well so it was it was november 2nd 2005 i was up in al -Kaim, um getting ready to kick off because i think november 5th was when operation steel curtain was going to kick off up at al -Kaim near the syrian border in the euphrates river and we got a call over the radio that gunshot six, six was down. And, and usually, you know, that, that, that's kind of the term of been shot down and nobody had any details of what happened. Um, yeah. So we were all glued to the radios trying to figure out. And there was, I mean, they basically, they launched the QRF, the dash two landed and, and did what they could. Cause they had many guns and a 50 cal. And so, QRF is quick reaction force. Right. Yeah. So they got some infantry guys on the ground, some Nates, they got some Nates, <laughs> running out there to uh, try to secure the area so they could, uh, you know, figure out what was going on. And um, turned out, you know, one of my, one of my good friends, uh, Major uh, Gerald Bloomfield, and one of my other squadron mates, Mike Martino, were both, uh, they both died. They were shot down with a missile, and they, uh, they fell out of the sky and died. Did you guys go in there and pull them out? We did. Uh, I, I did not. Yeah. But you're up in the air providing security as the ground troops were going in. And I was out. not, because this actually happened uh, between Ramadi well, kind of right outside Ramadi, maybe a few miles outside, I think we would say to the west of Ramadi, just, just random house. This guy had a shoulder fired missile and he just stepped out and shot down the helicopter. Did I mean, they take him out? Don't know. Don't, don't know, know if they, they ever got him. him. Don't know if they ever got the, the particular guy, but, um, yeah, well, it was a pretty ugly day. And, and what was worse was the insurgents were, at this point in time, people may remember this, they used to videotape everything they did. Mm, mm -hmm. So um, 
there were certain websites where they would post these things, and myself and another guy, uh, Ira Clark, who's he's a CEO down here in Miramar now, we were surfing through the internet and we found the video. And this was, you know, one of what I call one of the, the the raw moments of my life was many times they would post a video of them shooting the missile and it hitting the helicopter because nobody had any clue how they got them, right? Because we had uh, uh, systems on board the Cobra that would react to missile firings and, and shoot uh, flares off. So that system obviously didn't work. So we were trying to get clues. Well, this particular time, this video, and, and I don't think it was up very long before it got, we might have been the only two that saw it, was not a video of them shooting down the helicopter, but a video of the cockpit of my squadron mates. Mm. And basically what they were trying to do was, you know, get them out so they could do the usual like they did in uh, Somalia, parade mm. them around and, and, and everything. And I think the QRF got there fast enough. It stopped, you know, stopped that whole thing. They did bomb some of the the houses and around the area. So whether the one that shot them or not um, was was killed also, I don't know. But I know that uh, between the F-18s and the QRF, I know they went in and and, uh, and took care of business there. Yeah, I remember they behalf. did do that often because in the Joff Cemetery, uh, same thing. The first group that went in, uh, one of the guys that we know was – or one of the guys from my unit was taken out, and the next day we saw a photo of them standing on his helmet. Mm -hmm. You know, so they would do stuff like that. But for me, you know, they're trying to show how tough they are. But from the perspective of the grunts, it just pissed us off. And we went in and took them out. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was a few days before Steel Curtain kicked off and that, you know, which led to new baby. So which was Steel Curtain? Steel Curtain was the, uh, was the operation up at the Syrian border. So mm -hmm. the city of al -Qaim, So it was, I think, like went to the 440 district, al -Qaim, Huseba. And I'm just going from memory, but I think I'm right. Huseba down to what they called Old Ubaidi and New Ubaidi. And it basically, it ended at New Ubaidi. And as, they, as we fought from east to west, all the bad guys ended up running into New Ubaidi. And, you know, like, like you talked about, you know, as they, as, as they were, as we were going in and fighting, you know, these guys were dressing up like women and hiding amongst the sheep, the bad guys that try to sneak out. And mm -hmm. you're like, wow, mm tough and right tough guys you know it's like you talk a big game and then when it comes down to it you know you you cower out i'd be afraid too if the marine corps was coming after me yeah <laughs> and it was yeah it was and it, it was interesting because i mean the, the fight through that area you know they spent weeks and weeks and weeks basically getting all the the um what do you call them the friendlies the, the the good people out of the city by telling them hey whoever remains behind we are clearing this city we're going house to house room to room and if you stay, <clears throat> you're staying to fight. And some did, you know, so there were encampments up to the north, up to uh, down to the south where the, the residents went to live. And then Marines basically went through and we we provided close air support all the way through the city, which is the one day that I, I got ended up getting shot. Not was me that, personally. Was that him. near the uh, end of your third deployment? No, second. That was your second yeah, deployment? Yeah, the second deployment, yeah. When was the last time you were there? What point in time? 2009. I was just there on a staff, so... Oh, okay. Even though what it's was it like in 2009? Because I left last very, time very I was quiet. there was 2005. I mean, was uh, has any of the rebuilding, you know, has any of that taken place? They start rebuilding anything or fixing anything, or is it still pretty similar to the way it looked in... 05? I think it was, it was still pretty similar. This was when they were trying to build up so i was on the the what they used to be called the mnfi marine uh multinational forces iraq it was a four-star headquarters there with general odierno and basically what we were there trying to do was transition out so president obama had uh basically issued the order figure out how to uh draw down and get out of iraq uh properly or in the best way so that's what the the staff that i was on was doing so it was getting you know the ministry of interior the ministry of defense the uh all those different government entities in a position where they could start policing and governing their own country but what we found was you know in uh in typical i think of this part of the world is everybody you know you would have the ministry of interior he wanted to have all the same weapon systems as the ministry of defense so they wanted mortars and machine guns and everything and you're like dude you're, you're the you're the police so, you know, and, and 
So in that, that part of the world, you know, if, if someone has more than you do, they're stronger than you. And so everybody wanted to be the strongest one. And so it's just difficult to, to, to work with that. Did you find yourself in any uh, combat situations on your third deployment? At all? Oh, no. So it was just yeah. all in the first and second deployment. Right. Did you find yourself being in more intense combat during your second deployment? And the reason why I'm asking that is, mm -hmm. uh, at least from my personal experience, the first time we went out there, and this is what a lot of grunts would kind of joke about, is the first time we took out all the idiots. Right, all the guys who came out waving their AK, not really aiming mm -hmm. or doing anything like that. And then the second time, it was, you know, a lot of people coming in from different countries that just wanted to shoot Americans or whatever it was. Yeah. And we found that the fighting ended up being more intense mm -hmm. the second time out there. Yeah, and there were a lot of foreign fighters. That was the reason why we went, and uh, I think the majority of the reason for the, the fight up in Al Qaim was a lot of foreign fighters were pouring across the border through Syria. So they were coming from different areas and uh you know filtering through syria and just funneling their way down kind of down the euphrates to to ramadi and so on and so forth so we went through and basically just put a plug at the border and fought everybody through that entire area so you kept having to stop people from coming in and you're having to stop them with force yeah well yeah i mean, I mean the whole time yeah exactly so they you know they they stopped it and then we basically you know, the the, uh, the infantry guys got on the east end there right by the Syrian border, and they just went through. So every day, you know, the, the flot changed, the forward line of troops changed, and we would go out and support whatever they needed. And a lot of times we would, you know, we were firing Hellfire missiles many, many times. Just they would, there would be a guy in a building, whatever else, they'd call the building, we'd say, got it, and they'd clear it hot, and shoo, we'd put a missile in there, boom. And... Uh, they what was, what was the uh, largest organized combat mission that you were on? What is one of the most intense experiences that you remember that? That would have to be New Ubaidi, the one where uh, um, I was telling you where they were shooting at us so much. It was raining, raining bullets afterward. That was, uh, that was a crazy, crazy morning. And uh, I remember that, you know, like, like it was yesterday. It was a very interesting uh, thing. So, Second um, Battalion, First Marines, was there in New Ubaidi. If you if you look at New Ubaidi on the on the Euphrates River, it's kind of like Mickey Mouse ears, what they called it. It was almost like a heart that was cut off at the bottom. So it was it was bound by the river on each side, and for whatever reason, um, all the bad guys ended up running into this. I don't know if they, they I don't couldn't tell you why, but it was probably one of the most one of the nicest and most well built up kind of cities in this area where they had they had these row homes and they were all in a very predictable pattern rows like blocks of six or eight houses all the way across with roads in the middle and everything else so it was uh it was it was easy for us to be able to find targets because it was uh, what they did was they created these they call them grgs grid uh grid reference graphics so they would give us this 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 sheet of paper and basically, they would circle a group of houses, and they would call that A. And then they would number each one of those houses, so A1 through 20 or whatever. And then it would be B, C, D, E. So when they needed us to hit a house, they would say, hey, we got, uh, we're got we taking fire from A20. Let me know when you got the target. And it's like, boom, pull up the map, count it, you know, looking out there, one, two, three rows over, two, five houses over, one, two, three, four. Okay, yep, got it. So you're doing that while you're in the air. While we're in the air. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's how that's, that's how sophisticated pretty, our stuff was. Yeah, that's pretty cool, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was it, it was pretty intense because they would. Yeah, I remember that particular morning. It was, uh, you know, we were down to the south, and uh, two one was getting lined up around the city, and they had tanks in support as well. And while they were running around, and I can't remember his name, but he was a very very highly thought of uh, company commander. In 2-1, you know, we were down south, and all of a sudden we saw an explosion, Boosh, this big explosion. And, and there was a bunch of chatter over the radios and trying to figure out what was going on. And it turned out that uh, the company commander um, stepped on an anti-tank mine, I think it was. Anti-tank or anti whatever it was, it was not good. It killed him right there on the spot. And uh, that basically kicked off the fighting. It was, I don't know if the, the RC, the, the regimental commander came up over the radio and gave the, uh, the code word or whatever it was, but it was like go and 
I mean, the fight was on, and it was it was crazy. It was intense, like one of those where you hear you know there's people screaming over the radios, and they had uh, three JTACs. Well, they had two forward air controllers and a JTAC, so um, joint terminal attack controller. So he was a he was not a pilot. A forward air controller being a pilot who's trained as a JTAC, a JTAC being a non-pilot who's trained as a as a uh, joint terminal attack controller. So we're talking to him on the radio, and, and, and it's the, you know, the stuff that you, you see in the movies where people are screaming over the radios, mm-hmm. and I'm taking fire, blah, 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 and, and we're like, okay, you know, we're trying to get in, pull information so we can start narrowing it down, and then they went quiet. And we're like, shit. So we're, you know, we're still holding south, coming in to, uh, you know, trying to get more information that we can. And he comes back on the radio. He's like, you know, we need you in from the south now. And I'm like, okay, Roger. So we, we're coming in and is and trying to make sure I I, uh, I remember this right, just in case somebody I know or somebody that was there and correct me. But well, as we like, as what, we were coming 14 in, fourteen years ago. Yeah, it's, it's been you a missed while. Missed some details, I think people. <laughs> but it's I it's like burned into my mind as I remember this, you know, very intensely. As we're coming in, and I I remember we knew we were on the left third, so that. We were working with that guy, so we came in, pointed down at the left third, and as we're coming in, he comes back over the radio, we need you to hit whatever it was, D-15 <clears throat> was the particular house. So as, as we're coming in, I'm trying to get pull the information, so he gives it to me, and, and I'm literally, I'm, I'm flying in, and as I'm flying in, I'm looking at the, the map, and I'm counting the houses and the rows, houses and rows, and I'm like, okay, got the target, where are the friendlies? And he comes up, and I think it was, I think he said South 75. And I said, I remember, I, I think I it was, understand south 75 meters. Yes. Okay. Understand you, you need me to shoot over their heads. Yes. And then I, I, I can't remember if I even asked him. I think I came over and I was, I, I said something like, you understand what you are asking for, correct? Because usually danger close distance with rockets, I think is, it was over 400 meters. And anybody who's ever seen Cobras or Hueys shoot rockets, they're not incredibly accurate. So the worst case scenario is to be shooting over friendly heads with rockets. Because if you shoot one short, you know, you can hit your own guys. Mm. And so we're coming in, I'm counting the houses, I'm talking on the radio, getting from this guy, you know, where the target, we got the target. Where's the friendlies? We got the friendlies. And I remember, you, know, you understand what you're asking for. And then the company commander came over the radio. And, and the company commander came over and gave his initials. You know, said, this is, you know, whatever, you know, Bravo Alpha Hotel, whatever. And when the company commander gives his initials, that's his way of saying, I'm taking responsibility for this. I want it, and I'm taking responsibility for this. It's that bad. And so we're like, all right, and so I remember I'm I'm coming in, I'm I'm checking my dope, I'm telling my gunner, cause he's got the twenty, I'm like shoot long, and walk it down, you know don't don't go on the crosshairs because, you know just in case, and uh, you know and to compensate for drop because sometimes you know when things are happening super fast if you don't set the drop compensation, you could have the tar the crosshairs right on the target and the and the bullets will fall short as they drop mm-hmm. so, shoot long and, <clears throat> so. They cleared us hot. He shot long. I came in a little bit, shot my first rocket, and I think it went right over or right into the target. And when I knew I was zeroed, I just let the rest of them go. And it was just boom, 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 right into the target and pulled off. And then as I pulled off, the Huey had also shot rockets and followed up with the, the minigun. So a minigun shoots 3,000 rounds per minute, so 50 rounds per second. And they just finished up with covering our pull-offs, what they call it, cover the pull-offs. So he's just throwing a beehive of bullets out there to... Uh, and that's to give you time to get out of there without having any... Uh, without being attacked as you're escaping, in a sense. Mm-hmm. And let me yeah. rephrase that. Keep the enemy's head down. Keeping the enemy's heads down as you're mm-hmm. pulling out so you're not mm-hmm. getting shot from behind. Yeah, and that was the awesome thing about having a Huey with us. And, and the, the Huey and Cobra is a kind of a hunter-killer team. Worked really well because... The Huey could always, you know, the, 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 the guns could traverse almost all the way backwards. So they can engage and suppress targets until you're 
completely out in the clear so it's nice and what is the longest so <coughs> a lot of times uh, i think when somebody who hasn't been in combat and they think about a, a combat situation or a firefight you mm-hmm. often think about what you see in the movies and you think you know okay maybe what 20 minutes or something like that but i mean from my experience i was in um, an eight hour firefight mm-hmm. where it just kept going and kept going and it didn't stop for such a long time what was the longest one that you were a part of did were you ever in any where you actually had to go back resupply refuel and go right back out immediately yes but generally so we, were, we were limited with our fuel so that particular morning that was a uh, that was a full two-hour flight because not only did we we do that but we also um, went off to the west and as the attack continued forward we were firing hellfire missiles off of a predator drone so the regimental air officer had a predator about seven nine thousand feet over the city so he could look straight down on the targets so he could find targets with the predator put a laser right on the target and because we couldn't see the target from the cobra you know three four miles away he would call the target and uh you know tell he would basically say laser on our missile would pick up the laser and we would fire on the predator so i mean the ability to find targets from straight above with the predator and then engage them with the cobra's missiles like that was amazing because a lot of if he could see he could see the the, the friendlies going forward then he could see where the enemy was gathering so these guys he said they were gathering when i talked to him afterward they were all gathering huddling up in groups behind buildings making plans and stuff like that he just started dropping missiles right in the middle of those guys and that's the same one that a lot of people would know about if they played call of duty right where it shows the black and white screen and you could see the little figures mm-hmm. kind of moving yeah. around. Yeah, and... the forward-looking infrared, the FLIR. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so those that uh, are not in the military or do not know some of that terminology, just uh, think mm-hmm. of Call of Duty, right? <laughs> yeah, I think those are pretty realistic. I don't, I'm not a gamer, but I think the games are pretty realistic nowadays. With They're pretty accurate. You know, it's the, kind of crazy. The, the, the visual presentation they give with, with the... Uh, with the forward-looking infrared and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But, yeah, they would do that. And I want to switch gears for a minute. Since mm-hmm. you retired out, you did how many years? 22. 22 years, retired mm-hmm. lieutenant colonel, which a lieutenant colonel is a pretty high-ranking individual. I mean, I was always intimidated when I saw anyone over captain. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, crap, okay, I better make sure I have everything <laughs> squared away and I'm doing everything correctly. Mm-hmm. What advice or what recommendations would you give to somebody who's thinking about joining the Marine Corps, whether it be enlisted or if they want to go the officer route? What are some things that had you known when you were 19, 20, or whatever it was when you started thinking about it, mm-hmm. that if you had that information then, it would have made your career smoother or easier or better or whatever? Yeah, well, I mean, it's... It's definitely different because if you're if you're very young, and we used to do these things called educators workshops at the at the depot. You may have done one before, mm-hmm. and um, so one of the things we would always pass on to the educators, so that they would encourage and mentor the young college students is you know not everybody's ready to go to college when they finish high school, and it's hard to to get educators or, or anybody. Everybody wants their kid to go to college and 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 go on from there. But not everybody's ready for college when they when they finish. Maybe they want an adventure. They want to go in the Marine Corps. And one of the things we'd always tell the educators is, you know, they go in the Marine Corps, they can get, they'll have tuition assistance. So if they're smart, they can get two years of college done and their first two years of, uh, of uh, active duty service for free because all the colleges on campus charge what tuition assistance uh, pays, at least they used to. And so you could get two years of college done in the first four years and then when you, if you decide to get out of the Marine Corps, now you have a GI Bill that will get you two years to your bachelor's degree, and then you can save the last two years for a master's program later on if that's what you want to do, or a vocational program, or you know whatever. And there's there, there's lots of opportunities for young folks, and you get the VA benefits for the rest of your life, so you know to buy a house and and uh, you know whatever it is. So that's great. Uh, it's a great deal. And, and and for the officers, you know, I always say. Using myself as an example, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but the one thing that I did that I think that made me successful was I just never quit. And if you never quit, if you just keep on working hard and trying, people will help you along the way. So, you know, I grew up here, you know, even though I was, I was lucky, you know, I, I, I had a good career. I, I probably could have been 
So if I wanted to, I would have, I could have been at least competitive for, for Colonel. So I could have made it to full bird Colonel, um, had I stayed in longer and, you know, done some, uh, some other things post command. You know, I had a, I was lucky when I was in the Marine Corps. I mean, I was lucky to a point where I had great leadership and, um, I was fortunate enough to get meritorious corporal, meritorious staff sergeant. Uh, I was also selected for Marine of the quarter and I was, mm -hmm. uh, winner drill instructor of the quarter and selected for senior drill instructor of the quarter but what a lot of people don't know is my first year in the marine corps my nickname was shitbag shomer <laughs> and you know i had the mentality where uh, i wasn't going to listen to authority i joined mm -hmm. the marine corps because i slacked off when i was in high school didn't get the grades that i was capable of getting mm -hmm. and i thought to myself well am i going to go flip burgers the rest of my life or i'm going to go get myself into shape and do what i need to do to have a successful career and i also you know i wanted to be infantry and I wanted to be a drill instructor as well. And when I first got in, I saw how much the drill instructors were working. I thought to myself, there's no way. Mm -hmm. There's no way I'm going to do that, which I was lucky <laughs> enough to do it later on. But something that I would tell young Marines when they were joining or signing up or even, you know, um, recruits at Recruit Training Depot is if you push yourself and you try to outperform everyone, what you're going to hear from some of your peers is that you're kissing ass or you're doing things like that. Mm -hmm. And when I said, I, you know, I said, you know, when you get to a point where you're outperforming people, that's just what they're saying because they're not capable of doing what you're doing. And then when you get meritoriously promoted and you're collecting a bigger paycheck and you're being able to do things because you work hard. And I got to mm -hmm. the point where I said to myself, I said, you know, I never want to be in a position again where somebody has to tell me to do something. Mm -hmm. I always want to do it before I'm told. And anytime somebody said, Hey, how come you didn't do this? Or how come your uniform doesn't look good? It was like, I was slapping myself in the face because I didn't have it done beforehand. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad, not because they were telling me that I had to fix it, but because I didn't take the initiative to fix it beforehand. And I think just having that mentality alone, like always have it done. So nobody else can tell you that you didn't fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, never let somebody do that. And just by doing that alone. And then as I moved up and I would see junior Marines working hard and pushing themselves, then I wanted to help them. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to do what I could. So for example, you know, with the Marine Corps martial arts program, right? You're supposed to be a certain rank in order to get certain belt levels. Mm -hmm. You know, I would have young Marines who were just working their asses off and I would push it through the chain of command so they can get their belt. I'm mm -hmm. like, this guy is working hard. He's putting in the time. He's putting in the effort. He's done the entire syllabus and putting up the chain. And then they, they give him the belt or, you know, they don't, mm -hmm. he earns the belt. Right. But right. they, they allow it for something that maybe you need you have you're supposed to be sergeant to mm -hmm. be a black belt but now a corporal is yeah. a black belt and well it means something when uh you know people take the time to to show do something like that you, you let somebody progress ahead of their peers and what does it do in reality it uh it pushes their peers they're like oh it is possible and then and then it, it motivates them to, you know, well, well, shit, if he can do it, I guess if I, if I put in the effort, maybe I can do it too. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, I, I think, in, especially in the Marine Corps, when you get the people, the right, the right balance, people that want to be competitive and want to work hard and, and do those different things, <clears throat> it pays off. And I remember seeing that, you know, at the Recruit Depot with guys like Joe Alvarez. You know, we, my Star Major and I, Star Major uh, Wayne Peterson. Star Major, how you doing? He's, out to, he's retired now. But super guy, uh, sorry, Major Peterson. But we we fought hard to get Joe meritoriously promoted to Gunny, which is meritorious promotion to Staff Sergeant is hard. Meritorious promotion to Gunny is even harder. Really hard. So wait, did he get meritorious Gunny? Oh yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we got him meritoriously promoted to Gunny. Well, I say we got him. We pushed him, and he earned it. Oh, absolutely. He now, he was it. one of my, you know, I, I told a lot of people about this because when you move up as a drill instructor, it's it's mm -hmm. nice if you're, if you're in a company that sees how hard you're working, when you move up, one of the hookups is they'll give you a really strong J, mm -hmm. right? A really strong team. So if you're the senior, you don't have to work as hard, Yeah. you know, and that was one of the best things. He was, uh, I believe it was my last cycle. Mm -hmm. I was a senior senior and he was my J and he made it so easy. I didn't have to do anything. Oh, he's it was superb, so nice. Yeah. I mean, he ran the entire thing. Yeah. Superb guy. And that's why, you know, when I, I zeroed in on certain drill instructors, um, chief warrant officer Bergeron, another one, if he's watching and I was, I always give him a hard time about this. I had a staff sergeant who was an awesome, awesome Marine. But, um, I think his, his first year on the depot or so just wasn't good. He was like the, the, the honor man in his DI class had done phenomenally well, but 
there was a certain time down at the recruit depot where being a uh, you know by the book marine was not looked at very highly, and he was one of those guys that he's going to do the right thing, and he got caught up in a uh, in a staff that was you know not uh, didn't promote those kinds of things and kind of killed his morale a little bit and. Then, uh, he came to support battalion. He worked out the, at the uh, swim tank. So he was a McQuist, uh, uh, a water survival instructor. And I just came to realize, you know, this guy's really, really sharp. And I started pushing him. I was like, hey, I think you should uh, put in for the warrant officer package. Oh, no, I don't have the ASVAB score. I can't do it. I was like, so I, went, I asked him, you know, hey, if, is it too late to take the ASVAB? And they said, well, it won't make it in time for the board, but as long as he takes it, and gets it up to the depot before the packages go to headquarters Marine Corps, then we're good. So I told him, and I just had kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. When are you going to do it? And it was kind of like reluctant. I, I just didn't, I think he didn't think he was good enough to do it. And I was like, you, you're, you're way more than good enough to do this. So we finally, we, you know, we worked on, got his package in, took the ASVAB, got the ASVAB score in there right, I like, like literally right before they went to headquarters Marine Corps, first round selection warrant officer. I'm glad you brought that story up too, because yeah. a lot of young enlisted Marines are really intimidated by, mm -hmm. you know, officers that are higher up such as yourself. And the thing is, you know, talking to you right now and hanging out, it's, you know, you're, you're just like us, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're there and you want to take care of them. You want to do what you can to move them up and help them get promoted. Mm -hmm. So something that might be valuable to any young Marine that's listening to this, to know that a lot of the officers are there and they're on their side. You know, they're oh, often worried like, yeah. oh, no, the officer is the only one that I see when I get in trouble and I have to stand in front of, you know, the man. Mm -hmm. But it's like, no, if they come out and they seek you guys out and they ask for your help, you're going to help them and you're going to do what you can to move them up, which mm -hmm. I've seen quite often throughout your career that you told me about where Marines were uh, pushed into a better position because you were there to support what they were doing and you were able to see how much work they were putting in and, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Not as we said with the uh, first Aaron Alvarez, where you didn't give him Gunny, but you were in a position to be able to help him, in a sense, get what he had earned and worked very hard for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I think especially in his case, I believe that year there were there was one spot, and it was kind of like a toss up, I think, between the East Coast and West Coast, and we were able to get that second spot because there was another Marine. I think it's uh, first sergeant, it might be a sergeant major. No, I think it was Hidalgo. Another superb guy. I mean, just stellar Marine. It's, it's hard, you know, when you got these two guys who are just stellar dudes. When they, and I think what they did was because Joe was so good, they were able to get that second meritorious spot to San Diego and get it for him. So he got the second meritorious spot. So we ended up getting two meritorious gunnies that that year. His being the second. Both and, on the depot. Both on the depot. Yeah, yeah. Both. Uh, yeah, both on uh, depot recruit depot San Diego. And that was a big win for us, you know, because it was like, you know, wow, you did so well. We were able to get an extra meritorious gunny spot um, because they, I think they were going back and forth. Well, there's one for sure. We might have two. We don't know. And and we pushed so hard. And I think they finally realized this guy's. I mean, he was a he was a McMap instructor. He was a McQuist IT. I think it was so. He was a instructor trainer in, in the water survival. Um, stellar, all the way around you know, multiple combat tours. I think he's a scout sniper. He's you know done I mean? more combat tours since then. Too. Yeah, I mean, just, just. I mean, and you look at him and you're like, you know, okay, this is a combat Marine. You know, and not to take away from uh, First Sergeant Hidalgo, I think he he might have been, he was admin or one of the support establishment MOSs, and and, and there's, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But I think there's, there, there's something to be said for the guys that are going to be going into the combat arms that are just, stellar superb guys super highly trained you know so one day when he's a sergeant major you know he's been there he's mm -hmm. been to the depot two tours he's been on multiple combat tours um you know, he's he understands the process he knows how to take care of people and everything else so when he becomes a sergeant major he's already gotten all those experiences and oh by the way he's a combat arms guy on top of it all and uh you know as, as we all well know in the marine corps on the infantry side the infantry is the main effort for everything the Marine Corps does. The backbone. Yeah, the, the backbone. Corps. Everybody else in the Marine Corps supports the infantry, period. So. And that's actually a, an analogy that we use at Camis and Canines, right? The mm. veterans within the program are the backbone, and then everything else supports it. How did you become involved with Camis and Canines being the vice president? 
Well, actually, Kalani and I served on the depot together, and that's where we, we got to know each other and um, you know, through different interactions. And I, I had no idea about the struggles. I was lieutenant colonel. He was a captain, so you know, he was probably – and he wasn't one of my Marines. But, you know, we kind of gravitated toward each other, and, you know, I got to know him there. And um, like I said, I didn't know any part of his story. I didn't know the struggles he was going through. And then, you know, I left the depot. I think we, we loosely stayed in contact – and then, you know, he came back from his uh, you know, situations he'd had up north, came back to San Diego. Um, I ran into him at a uh, networking mixer, a uh, Veterans Beer Club. VBC, yeah, Veterans Beer Club. I think it was the one down in Coronado. So, you know, ran into him there, and we just kind of reconnected. And, and I was, uh, was post-divorce at that point and just kind of, you know, doing a lot of things to myself and felt like, you know, hey, I, I need to do more now and, uh, you know, do stuff for the community. It was kind of like, you know, I, I like, I don't, I don't care for recognition for anything I do, but I like to help people along. And um, so I was like, you know, I like to, you know, volunteer. So I just started volunteering with Cameras and Canines, doing different, you know, booths or different events and stuff like that. And he just asked me if he wanted to team up with you and him. And I said, yeah, of course, we'll do that. And and uh, kind of the rest is history. And starting a nonprofit is a lot of work. Oh my god! And you know, there's a, and, and and you guys do the lion's share of it. I mean, no, I'll be honest. Yeah, you do more than what you take credit for. No, but no, no. Uh, a lot of people out there, I hear quite often. You probably do as well. Once people see that you're operating a 501c3 nonprofit and you're doing things within the community, you have other people who want to embark on the same thing or they want to start their own nonprofit mm -hmm. and they want to help the community or they want to help dogs or they want to help, you know, name it. What are some things that you might be able to give them as advice for when they're starting out or things that have maybe uh, helped you along the way? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, you know, like they, they say in everything else, it's network, network, network is, is have a good network of people that can at least introduce you or, or, you know, help you along with other folks that may not be able to provide financial assistance, but can provide business assistance or, you know, just advice, things to think of. Cause you know, like I've always talked about, you know, even the when, when I was active duty, I never could think of everything on my own. And I always would rely on, you know, my junior guys to, you know, officer and enlisted to come up with ideas about stuff. So it's, you know, it's, it's branching out and, and seeing who has good ideas and things that'll work and, you know, has, who has good business acumen, who has, uh, you know, networks of folks that can volunteer, you know, people that want to donate. Because like I always say, you know, here, you know, with Cameras and Canines is, you know, a lot of people support us, but they don't have the time to, to do what we do, but they can support us financially so that we can do what they like that we're doing. So, you know, that's, that's what's helpful and beneficial to us is folks that can help us out financially because it is, you know, it is very expensive. And you know, like we always say, 100% of everything we do goes right back into camis and canines. And it's just, you know, if, if it's not going into the veterans specifically, it's going into, you know, you and Kalani putting gas in your car so that you can go do things. You know, mm -hmm. it's not... You know, taking we're, care of the dogs. Or, yeah, I mean, you know. we're not making any money on this. It's, you know, any, everything that's spent is spent toward camis and canines. What's great, and I think what you said is perfect, too, with the networking, because the networking that we have done with camis and canines has really helped continue to support what we're doing. You know, I mean, for mm -hmm. example, recently, IB Pets, which is a local pet store here in the San Diego area, yeah. they just donated 900 pounds of dog food. Right. And then we also have Lucy Pet, which is up in Los Angeles. They donated 3,000 pounds of yeah. dog food. So if you're trying to start a nonprofit, a 501c3, absolutely networking, getting those connections, because the support of the community is really what makes a nonprofit thrive it really what mm -hmm. helps make the nonprofit successful and what we always say is you know camis and canines is not our nonprofit it's the communities you know everybody mm -hmm. is part of it so by kind of having that mentality and noting that you're starting a 501c3 for the community when you look at it that way I think it really helps the growth and it kind of gives everybody a sense of ownership in a way because everybody's a part of it mm -hmm. and having it grow. And another big part, which we're constantly trying to do, and it's always a struggle is that social media is kind of mm -hmm. getting it out there, showing people what you're doing, and that's going to help get people to want to help and continue to support what it is that you're doing. Now you're also 
one of the co-founders <laughs> of On Season Canine Nutrition. Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to be entrepreneurs. I think that's something that is becoming more and more popular, being an entrepreneur. What advice would you give for a young entrepreneur is trying to start out? Everything is not easy. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's everything is, is a lot of work. And, you know, I've always used the analogy of growing a business is, you know, I think back when the dot-com boom happened, you know, I always use... I always use the tree analogy. I, I think I, I, I used the tree analogy with you the other day, didn't I? How if a business grows, you know, like a tree, a tree, if a tree grew too fast, the first storm that hit it would blow it over because the roots wouldn't be strong enough to hold it up. So the analogy I always use is, is out of a tree. You know, a tree's roots grow commensurate with the tree so that when a storm comes, it can withstand the storm. If, uh, you know, like I said, if, if tree grows up too fast, like a business, if the business grows too fast and, and the roots aren't really set, then it probably can't weather the first storm. And so it's being patient and, you know, life cycle of a business is, I think it, you really don't see moderate success, at least for about three to five years. You know, it takes time and then, um, and then things start to happen pretty quickly. So it's a snowball effect. Yeah. So, you know, for us starting and it's like, okay, we have, you know, several hundred bags of dog food and it's like okay now what do we do you know, if we if we grow too fast then we can't keep up with demand but mm -hmm. if we don't create demand then we don't sell our products so it's like trying to find that Perfect that happy balance. medium you know of okay we're we're in a good spot because you know we are so small it takes time when we say oh like we did with the salmon oh we want to do salmon well what's what's the process well we got to call the pouch manufacturer who are awesome guys american pouch converters awesome dudes they're uh, Jim and Andras Drassic. Also veteran owned. Yep, also veteran owned. He was an Army and Marine Corps veteran. So um, great guys. I remember calling him up and he's like, brother, I got you. We, you know, we, we can do this and made awesome pouches for us. And then, so, but that takes time. Put the order in, takes time because we're not the only customer he has. So mm -hmm. he's got to put us in line, get our pouches filled with the product. And then when they're all done, get them sent back to us. So, it, you know, it's not a it's not an immediate process and we're, we're small fry. So, you know, we had to jump in line. If we were a huge order, I'm sure they would drop everything and fill all, all of our stuff first, but we're not. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's the process of, of just, you know, growing slowly and, and, and growing correctly. And one of my favorite quotes talking about the tree that is knocked over becoming an entrepreneur. This is being part of on season canine, I think is my sixth company <laughs> in total. And, uh, let me tell you all the other ones are not running and it's, you're going to fail at times, right. And failing oh, forward, it, yeah. you know, that's one of my favorite quotes as cliche as it sounds fail forward. I think too many people, they become very excited about something. They start it. It mm -hmm. doesn't work out the way that they planned and they quit, you know, and I was reading mm -hmm. this book a while back. I don't remember what book it was, but I love the story that the author wrote. And he's basically talking about this young man who wanted to start a company and he called it, uh, four up, you know, and it was, it was a soda company that he wanted to start and it wasn't successful. And then he started another one called five up and, and that one failed. And he said, you know what, I'm going to try another one. So he tried six up and that one failed and he quit. Mm -hmm. And about a year later, seven up came out and blew up and it made millions and it, you know, and he wasn't part of it cause he quit too soon. Mm -hmm. So the big thing, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur is to not quit is to push through the hard times is to, you know, focus on, Focus on everything that we do, and this is, you know, I relate a lot of things to dog training. A lot of people know I'm a dog trainer, is motivation, whether it's motivation to access something pleasant or motivation to prevent something unpleasant. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I love Tony Robbins. I love listening to him talk. And one of the things he talks about is, you know, figure out, try to focus on what, where the rewards are. Far too often people think about the pain, right? Mm -hmm. The pain of doing something. Oh, I don't want to do it. But they're not focused on the benefit of doing the hard work, right? It's like, oh, I don't want to go to the gym. The gym's a lot of hard work. But if you focus on the value, the benefits that you get from working out, and that's your main focus, then going to work out is the easy part because, you know, it's yeah. going to increase your health. It's going to increase the way that you feel. You're going to be better day to day. You're going to live longer. You're going to be healthier, all these mm -hmm. different things. So focusing on the right thing because we're the only creatures that can really decide what it is that we focus on. You mm -hmm. know, and somebody else said it. They said, embrace the suck. Right. Yeah, that's, gonna... a, that's a common term. <laughs> Embrace the yeah, especially for Marines, you know, it's like it sucks. It's cold, mm -hmm. it's wet, it sucks, but there's gonna be some tough times. Mission. And one of my I'm gonna do a shout out to one of my favorite authors, uh, Tim Ferris. I even mm -hmm. I listen, I subscribe to his podcast. 
and he wrote the four hour work week. And I've read that book probably three times. I also bought a copy and sent it to Kalani. I need to give you a, a, a copy of it as well. But reading through it, that was actually one of the main inspirations that helped start on season canine because mm. when I was reading it far too often, we get in our own way. We think that something's not obtainable. We think, Oh, how can we start a dog food company? How, you know, how are we going to be able to create the product? How are we going to be able to do? And you get overwhelmed by thinking of all the different things that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And then once you realize that it is a possibility, it becomes much easier, which leads me to the last point that I want to say is if you are starting a business, find a good team, right? Finding mm. a good team is probably one of the most important things. And it has to be a good team because you don't want to get a bad team because then you're people you can trust. I think is mm -hmm. you know you know the biggest thing, and that's huge. Mm -hmm. Finding that good team, someone that you trust, someone that you're good to work with, and yeah. you're willing to work with even when it does suck. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Well, I mean, and you know, and, and hopefully in five to ten years, you know, you're on the Joe Rogan show, you're on his podcast. He has a podcast, right? He does. I think I yeah. see some of those um, on YouTube. I usually follow the jujitsu podcasts, you know, when they start, you know, Eddie Bravo and all the other guys when they're talking about those things. But well, I train at Eddie Bravo's gym. Oh, is it the that's Tenth Planet? Tenth Planet. Oh, okay, yeah, that's Eddie Bravo. All right. Yep. 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 And, and Joe I... Rogan helped him name it. Oh, did he? But I was also fortunate enough to be on the Fighter and the Kid. So the Fighter and the Kid is Brian Callen and uh, Brendan Schaub. Okay. Who's a UFC champion fighter, mm -hmm. uh, retired recently. And I was lucky enough to be on there for probably 15 minutes. It was a Will Sasso episode and Will Sasso was running late. So Brian Callen, I trained his dog. So Brian Callen said, you know what? Let's just start talking for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there like, really? Okay. <laughs> you know, he gets a million downloads a month. So that was a right. little intimidating, but fun at the same time. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. But like I said, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll be on Joe Rogan's show talking about the first five failures you had and. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and how you're successful now and that, you know, the whole point is never quit, you know, and, and a lot of the, one of the things I used to tell, especially my junior Marines was, you know, I'd say, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm just a regular dude. I grew up in San Diego. I went to, you know, I live in Claremont I went to Point Loma high school. I was just a regular kid. I was the, uh, I guess you want to call it the top gun generation. Top gun came out when I was 16. So I'm dating myself. It was 86. Yes. I'm 49, almost a month and a half. <laughs> So I'll be 49 on my next birthday. But so as, you know, the top gun generation, you know, we all wanted to go fly for the Navy or we don't know, whatever. We all wanted to go fly F-14s and, and, and do all that cool stuff. But I never really understood the process, right? So I was just a regular high school kid. I mean, I, I went through, I didn't set the world on fire. And so I ended up going to community college. I went to Mesa College here in San Diego and took some time even then to figure it out because... What I think is, is beneficial is when you have parents that have gone through the process, they understand the college process and what you need to do, you kind of have a leg up. Well, my, neither one of my parents did. You know, we were, I was, you know, we, my sister and I grew up great, you know, pretty much straight middle class here in Claremont, and we had good lives, but neither one of our parents went to college. So I had to figure it all out on my own. So, you know, once again, never quit and show up. You know, back in the old days, and people want to understand this now, you couldn't do everything online. You actually had to fill out a form and go stand in line at the school and wait your turn, turn it into admissions, pick your classes. I mean, it was just a whole different kind of process. You really had to put in a lot of effort. You couldn't just sit in your house on your computer and do it back then. And um, back then, 1988. Um, so <clears throat> did community college and tried to figure out. And that's when I kind of got... And I was dating a girl then whose dad was a Marine Corps pilot. And so I was like, oh, that sounds pretty cool. And he kind of introduced me to the process of how to, you know, get, go see officer selection officer and the whole bit. So I did that while I was in college and uh, transferred to San Diego State. In my junior year, I went to officer candidate school, 10-week course out in uh, Quantico. And then uh, I came back, did one more year of school, and then I was commissioned in 1993. And, you know, it was a... You know, the whole thing is, you know, like I said, I wasn't the smartest guy in the world. There were a lot of people that had way better grades than I did. But I just kind of just never quit. I just kept plugging through and plugging through and finally got it, went to OCS and got my commission. I, I was contracted to go to flight school and went to flight school. And, you know, I think uh, academically, especially with uh, like uh, multiple choice tests, I struggled with those at the, at the basic school. I was just not a good multiple choice test taker. Like everything else I did really, really well in, but I just was terrible at multiple choice tests. And it carried over to flight school, 
where I had some trouble with those, but my flying was always good. So I just never quit. I just kept powering through and, and, uh, you know, made it through flight school, got my wings, made it to the, to the HMLA community, was flying Cobras, did well there. And that's where I worked hard and kept working and working and working, learned, you know, it was very interesting to me. So I learned all the weapon systems, did really well. And within three years or so, was able to attend a uh, weapons and tactics instructor course, you know, which is a, a high level graduate level aviation training school. So I got to do that in the Cobra, which was pretty prestigious and, and uh, you know, just kind of continued on from there. So I was, I was very lucky and it, it just came down to hard work and perseverance. I mean, that's, I think perseverance is a big word. And that actually made yeah. me think of something far too often when somebody is trying to attempt to do something, they want that tree to grow really fast or mm -hmm. they're trying to, take on a challenge that may be too big for them at the time. And it doesn't mean that they can't get to that point, but multiple successful opportunities, I think help create more successful opportunities and it helps it grow. And, uh, an analogy I heard a while back, which I thought was an absolutely brilliant analogy. If you're trying to, if you're just now start trying to uh, work out, right? You want to start working out and you want to get into shape. You can't sit down on a bench and put 300 pounds on and start knocking out reps. Mm -hmm. You have to start with just the bar. You have to get your muscle warmed up and then you have to add weight and you slowly add to it. And everybody knows that's the process that you have to take in order to increase your muscle and increase mm -hmm. your strength. And we need to look at everything like that. Start small, get multiple successful opportunities or multiple successful uh, events and that's going to help create more successful events and it's also going to boost your confidence because if you mm -hmm. try something too difficult and you fail then I think that's when some people will quit so yeah. start small get those small wins over and over again that increases the confidence which helps get you in a better position to do something even more challenging and to become that super successful mm -hmm. person right yeah as we both learned with uh, jiu-jitsu yeah, you know, I've been doing jujitsu for about a year now, and it, um, you know, for for me, it's been life changing. Where, you know, you wouldn't think, and I kind of blew it off for a little while because my my little one was going, and I, I wasn't blowing it off, but I was you know, a little intimidated, but also wanted to make sure that I was physically ready at my advanced age to start jujitsu, and um, it's been amazing. I mean, I I can't think of any better like physical and mental therapy than jujitsu, and you sit and wonder why, you know, after a year. Why am I still making the same mistake and still getting my butt kicked? And because, like you said, it is a slow process. There, mm -hmm. There's a reason why it takes seven to ten years to get a black belt in jujitsu. Is because it is, I mean, a minute by minute learning process. And you don't learn it in a year. You don't learn it in two years. Five. I mean, you're always learning, but you know, to get to that level it takes a long, long time. And I think sometimes people just don't have the patience to to wait. You know, it's but, so complex. Yeah. That sport is so complex. And it I is. thought I thought that I was so good at grappling when I got out of the Marine Corps since I was a black belt instructor mm -hmm. in the Marine Corps, which is, you know, it's like mixed martial arts, you know, and it's more oriented towards combat. And I signed up at a school in LA, Hey Diago's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm -hmm. And I was getting choked out by like every blue belt there. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then <laughs> and that kind of humbles you. You're like, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, the the level of technique that these guys have and how technical they are i mean mm -hmm. uh, speaking of joe rogan what he calls it is high level problem solving with dire physical consequences and <laughs> what i find really interesting about it a lot of the guys that That's train good. at these different jujitsu schools mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the men and women they're all very intelligent people you mm -hmm. actually find really intelligent people there because it is so complex and there's so many different ways you can move and and get into different positions and it's so much fun too. If anybody mm -hmm. is getting ready to start jujitsu, um, don't quit until after you start beating people. If you <laughs> get to a point where you start tapping people out and then you want to quit, fine. But don't quit before that. Yeah. Because when you're getting choked out constantly, it's not fun. But the second you start tapping people out and you mm -hmm. start winning and you start getting submissions that you were being put in, you know, at first, then it's such a great feeling. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. And I mean, I credit, you know, Mike Phelps, Delmar Jiu-Jitsu Club, uh, hashtag DMJJC. Is that right? That's a good school. Yeah. No, yeah, they're awesome. Cool. Yeah. Right here in, uh, in Del Mar, right next to the racetrack. I mean, new people every day. I mean, last yesterday, the class was 24, six to eight year olds the biggest class I've ever been in. And that's a lot of kids. Yeah, I think it's great to get kids involved at a yeah. young age too. And then my class last night, you know, shout out to Keenan Cornelius. Um, he's, he's doing some, filming some techniques that he was teaching last night, but 
you know, had a, an awesome class. Keaton Cornelius is teaching about once a week now at our, at our school. And he's, a, you know, a phenomenal BJJ guy. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, dif- you know, the difference. And it was a tough class. I mean, we all left just exhausted. Because our warm-up, instead of doing like a regular warm-up, and everything, we, did, we did grips. We did grip, you know, grip warm-ups, breaking mm-hmm. grips and, you know, getting underhooks and everything else. I mean, before we even started rolling, we were all pouring sweat because we would, you know, you, you do it and then you switch partners. And, you, and so it was, it was Yeah, good. it's hard to go to the gym after jiu-jitsu. Oh, you're wiped I try out. to go to the gym afterwards and I'm so smoked that yeah. my gym workout just is, I was telling uh, Erica the other day, my girlfriend, I was saying, you know, I really need to go to the gym before jujitsu because <laughs> i just i can't after jujitsu i'm just i'm uh-uh. beat i'm just oh, wore yeah. out all right so believe it or not we are already over an hour all right, all right. yeah it goes fast there we go uh so before we sign off um if anybody has any questions for you or maybe want or they're looking for some advice or anything like that is there a good mm-hmm. spot where they can reach you know reach out to you yeah the like email or phone number or both okay email so which email be? uh it would be tony t-o-n-y at Cammies and caninescom C A M M I E S A N D C A N I N E S dot com. And I'll add that in the description so it'll be yeah. there as well. So excellent. That's the episode for today. I want to thank you for taking the of time to that sit was my down pleasure. And, thank you. and chat and let me come over and set up all this equipment. It's been a good time. No, yeah, I'm honored. Thank you. All right. That's a wrap. <laughs>